Rachel. And I don't know most of you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say, hello, my name is Rachel. And then you are going to say in unison, hello, my name is not Rachel, unless, <laughs> unless it actually is. And I will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, remember everybody's names, especially those who say it really loud. Are you ready? Hello, my name is Rachel. Hello. Is there a Gary over here? That's all I heard, and there wasn't one. That's the worst. Hey, one thing that, I don't know, did you mention the child care reimbursement? Okay, life groups are awesome because free date night. Um, we will pay for your child care. So we are so committed to you getting in. We need it. Um, we are so committed to you getting into community and having true relationships that we will pay for someone to watch your kids. So you hire them, we pay them. Doesn't that sound good? Yes. yes. I'm also so committed to life groups that if you would like to, while I am preaching, I give you carte blanche to get on our app and look through the life groups that we are offering this term. And then afterwards, you can go out and sign up. What are you trying to show me? You're on the app. You don't need it. You pay attention to me. <laughs> but um, boom. Um, so we are right now in a freedom series, and I also would recommend, if you weren't here last week, putting in your AirPods and listening to Ben's sermon instead of mine today. It is so valuable. He talked about Christian worldview versus secular worldview, and how many of you know it's important right now to know what we believe? Um, so if you are interested, or if you get bored, just pop in those AirPods. I won't judge you a lick if you want to go listen to his sermon from next week, from last week. And next week, he'll be here again. <laughs> um, one thing I just wanted to let you know is that I love this house. How many of you say you love this house as well? Maybe some of you, it's your first time. You will grow to love this house. It is a privilege to be able to minister with my husband. Uh, we've been married for 16 years, and we met in college in Portland uh, in a Hispanic ministry at our church, and we were both on the worship team, and we have been called and gifted together, and that is um, a true blessing for us, and so I'm grateful that we've been able to minister together for the past 16 years. Well, so a little bit about me is if you're familiar at all with the Enneagram, I am a type 1, which I have mentioned previously. Thank you very much. Um, the type 1 can be problematic in relationships, in marriage, in life in general. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with the Enneagram, we are dubbed the perfectionists, which sucks. Um, but Ben says enough people got to the author that he changed our name to improvers. Isn't that good? So I'm an improver. But something I've realized recently, I've been able to a little bit uh, hone in on the, the kinds of tasks that I like. And I like tasks that either can have a perfect outcome or there's no expectation of perfection. So in my house, you will only see one wall that has pictures that are right in a row because it would kill me if they ever like were too far apart or a little bit off. And so there's a lot of collages in my house, a lot of picture collages because it doesn't matter if they're perfect because it's a collage, right? Um, other things I enjoy are spelling bees because there's only one, well, certain words, there's not only one way to spell the word, which is frustrating. But most words, there's a right way to spell it. Um, I like math because there's one right answer. If you're talking about music theory versus songwriting, I prefer music theory because, again, one right answer. Um, Drawing is really hard for me because I wasn't very good at drawing, and so I could never fully portray what was in my head onto paper, and it never has looked good ever. Um, I also really enjoyed my job at Hollywood Video because I got to alphabetize all day, <laughs> and every video had a home, and it was perfection. Uh, I also prefer quilting versus clothes making because clothes making has a body, and... Those are variable. Those are very variable. Um, um, another thing, like, when you guys see this, Ben says throw it away right now. I don't want to even look at it. 
you know, for a lot of people, when they look at this, they just say, you know, it's $2. Throw it away. Go buy a new one. But when I look at this, I say, challenge accepted. Because <laughs> there is a perfect way that this can end up. And it is worth the time to do it. I'll tell you what. Like, if you have a wonky slinky, I'm your girl. <laughs> I'll put it right back together. But how many of you would say, this is a little bit what our world looks like right now? Yeah. Uh, our society, our nation, our state. Maybe some of your families look like this right now after this past year that we've been through. Um, maybe some of your relationships, maybe some friendships look like this right now. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is that often our thought life looks like this, our mind. How many of you would agree with that? Got really quiet in here. Stay with me. The question I have for you today is, do you control your thoughts or do your thoughts control you? Because Proverbs 4.23 says, your thoughts run your life, so be careful what you think. Guard it. My goal today is for you to know and to understand that God died not so, he sent his son to die, not just so that you would have eternal life, but that you could have freedom in your thought life now. Not later. No. Yeah? But it's up to us to do the work here. I want to pray for you before we go on. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this place to come till up the soil of our hearts, Lord. Would your word do a work in us today? We open up ourselves to you. We surrender our preconceived ideas and notions, and we say that we're open to what you want to say to us today, Lord. We're here to receive. We're here to change by the power of your Holy Spirit. So we welcome you to come do a work today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 One more. Amen. amen. Yes! We were on our way to church this morning, and I asked my kids to pray for me. And Isaiah, my youngest, he's six. Jesus, I pray that Mama would not crash, and that she would not die. <laughs> so I'm not going to crash and burn today. In Jesus' name, we were, uh, this summer, we were at our friend's house. We were staying at a friend's house, Ben and I, and she had a bunch of books on her shelf. And that's always inspiring when you go to someone's house and they have a lot of books, right? Because you're on vacation. You can actually read. Um, and one of them was called Who Switched Off My Brain by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. How many of you guys have heard of her, familiar with her? She's a, she's a brain. Um, so it's, I know, this is pun. So the book is Who Switched Off My Brain? I read the back of it, and I thought, wow, yeah, I think this could really apply to my life. Clearly, the person who wrote the back thing was not her because they made it sound like no problem. And then as I started reading, I was like, I consider myself pretty smart. And it was really meaty and very, like, so I thought, I'm going to write while I read because when you write, everybody knows, it commits it to memory. That didn't work either. <laughs> they are wrong. My friend Haley would say, Rachel, it's a you problem. You have a problem accessing the memory files. That's why I keep her around. She helps me remember all the great things that have happened in my past that I forget. <laughs> so she is, um, Dr. Caroline Leaf is a cognitive neuroscientist, and she's been studying for over 30 years um, the connection between the brain and the mind. So she talks a lot about toxic thoughts and cleaning up your mind. But one thing that she talks about is called cognitive dissonance. And I have the definition up on the screen. It's the mental discomfort that results from holding two contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values and consistently participating in an action that goes against one or more of those. So like smoking, we all know it causes lung cancer but consistently participating in that action that goes against what you believe or know to be true, that's called cognitive dissonance. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another example. When you're at work or home, which most of you, nobody's working from home these days, right? Um, your computer isn't monitored, and you often find yourself browsing the Internet or even catching up on TV shows instead of working. Sure, you eventually get to the bare minimum of your work, but you know it's wrong, and you could be doing more. You might feel guilty knowing you'd be in trouble if anyone found out, 
But we read an article about workplace productivity that says people are more productive when they work in short bursts or take frequent breaks. So I'm just increasing my productivity, you tell yourself. Another area of cognitive dissonance that we all deal with is, let's face it, every time we go to McDonald's. Or if you see that health food owner, health food shop owner going into McDonald's, you're like, that's cognitive dissonance. And it can cause brain damage over time, and it's actually toxic. Do you believe this? So what I found is that in Christian communities, the way that we use scripture can actually be cognitive dissonance. It can cause cognitive dissonance. I'll tell you what I mean. So I, I was raised in the church. Some of you maybe be newer to church or you've experienced this where you start to hear phrases that people use, like renewing my mind or taking every thought captive. And so you think, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to start saying that. I'm renewing my mind. I'm taking every thought captive. And it just becomes part of your verbiage. But what happens with cognitive dissonance is when we use the verbiage, but we don't apply it. That's causing brain damage in us. And it's toxic. It's kind of like looking at this with a bippity boppity boo and expecting it to change without the Disney cartoon, because she actually did change things with her bippity boppity boo. But we can't. <laughs> I'm taking every thought captive. You keep in perfect peace to him whose mind is steadfast on you. I'm renewing my mind, but this isn't changing. The word of God is powerful, and it's true, and it's full of life-giving words, but its words do not negate personal responsibility, especially when it comes to your thought life. We can't bippity-boppity-boo it. So gaining freedom in our thought life requires work. It requires the Holy Spirit's work and our work. Because the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. He's the one who comes alongside us, gives us strength. Never underestimate the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to change the way you think. Also, it's your responsibility. <laughs> but I did have a moment the other day where I ordered a latte, and I always order the same thing. It's a double latte, a double espresso shot with whole milk. And so I know exactly how much it should weigh. And I am the person who, if it's not right, I will kindly and graciously ask you to remake my beverage because I've worked in coffee for years and I want my customers to be happy. So I'm sure they want me to be happy, <laughs> right? And they don't mind remaking it. And um, so anyways, I got my latte and I started walking out the door and I was like, it's light. That means too much foam because the foam is light and it looked full to the person making it, but it wasn't full. And normally I might go back in and say, could you pour some more milk in it? And they so graciously always say yes. Um, but this time, guess what happened? A new thought entered my mind. It's just like a flat white. <laughs> you don't know me very well, but that's a big deal to have that kind of mind shift. Because a flat white notoriously is a little bit, it's just a little bit less. It's the same beverage, it's just a little bit less. So never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit to do a little work. Catch you off guard. Peace and a sound mind are your portion as a believer, but they are also your choice and your responsibility. God is not about mind control. And he's not about a bunch of robots. Okay? He gave us a mind and the ability to think, and he wants us to do that. Uh, on the screen, you're going to see a bus. So let this bus symbolize your mind. Hopefully, your mind has a driver. The driver... <laughs> The driver is you, and I'm the driver of my bus. The bus is my mind, and the passengers are my thoughts. We drive something similar to this with quite a bit of action in our back seats. We have five kids, um, and it's, it can get really loud. But So some passengers on the bus are disruptive. Some of them are disgruntled. 
Some of them are fighting with one another. Some of them are quiet and peaceful. Um, but, but I decide who is on my bus because I'm the driver. So if you've got some disgruntled passengers in your thought life, that's your job to kick them off the bus. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yes, that is correct. So how do we resolve this cognitive dissonance, this tangled mess of thoughts in our minds? Let's go to Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. These are, these are one of my life scriptures. I love this. Okay, it says here, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that sound nice? Peace will guard our hearts and minds. That word peace in the Greek is irene, and it means peace of mind. It means wholeness. It means all the essential parts are joined together. Not like this. Yeah? Doesn't this, to me, even though I know there's a peaceful outcome, this doesn't say peace to me. In the Old Testament, the word is shalom, and it's completeness or soundness of mind. Isn't a mind at peace the ultimate goal? Wouldn't that be amazing? Let me just show you what that might look like. You can all breathe. You thought I was going to do this while I was preaching. No. This is a possible thing. Now, Let's look at some scriptures with our new lens of choice and responsibility that there are several scriptures that we've taken and we don't realize that there's a his part and there's an our part, okay? So we're going to look through some scriptures. You're not going to be able to remember all these, but I just want to give you sort of a new lens to look at these. So Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And so there it is. So his job is he will keep us in perfect peace, but we have a job too. Our job is to trust in him and to fix our thoughts on him. So that thoughts is thoughts and purposes and, and intentions. I love that we've taken these 21 days of prayer and fasting to say, Lord, what are your intentions? These may be my intentions, but what are yours? And leaning on those intentions. John 14, 27 Love this scripture. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Isn't that really nice? I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. My peace I leave with you, that's my job. But your job? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. That's actually my job. That word troubled means agitated. So which things am I allowing in that are bringing agitation? Because if I'm letting, you know, social media and news, all this garbage in that's agitating me, then why would I expect him to give me his peace? Because I'm allowing my heart to be troubled. I'm allowing myself to be afraid. So I can't expect his peace in that moment because he gave me the little equation there. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. I read part of it just a minute ago, but I want to look at it with that new lens. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So it's kind of like a sandwich. Like the, the piece is the meat. But then there's things we got to do. And we can't expect the results of the piece without doing the things we got to do. Do not be anxious about anything, but with your prayers and thanksgiving, present those things to God. And I look at verse 8, um, not necessarily as a checklist or as a to-do list, but as a tool on how to not be anxious. 
So he's saying if you're struggling with anxiety, maybe go through this list and see. Usually we stop at true, right? Because anxiety often comes when something we're believing is not true. But as you go throughout that list, pretty sure you're going to realize, yeah, this is why I'm anxious. I need to let these things go because at the end he says, these are the things to think about. The things that are excellent and praiseworthy, admirable, pure, lovely, noble, true. And then that's when the peace comes. Romans 8, 5, and 6 says here, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit set their minds on what the Spirit desires. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But the mind of the Spirit leads to life and peace. I don't know about you, but I want life and peace. To me, that sounds really good. So I've crossed out what we're not supposed to do. Don't live according to the flesh or set your mind on what the flesh... You can cross it out in your Bible. Maybe not. Uh, But those who live in accordance with the Spirit set their minds on what the Spirit desires. So that's our responsibility. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. And death is all the miseries that are results of sin. But the mind of the Spirit leads to life and peace. It sounds like bliss. So to live in accordance is a day-to-day, daily. So if you're daily setting your mind on the flesh, what's the flesh? It's that part of you that God hasn't touched yet. It's the part of you he hasn't transformed yet. So if your mind, if you're setting your mind, your thoughts and your purposes daily on spiritual things, on things that the Spirit desires, that's going to bring life and peace. And if you're setting your mind daily, your thoughts and your purposes on what the flesh desires, that's going to be death. Nobody wants death. Those are the things that determine your outward behavior. Now, we're going to do an exercise together. And for most of you, it's going to be very uncomfortable. (laughs) Sorry, not sorry. Uh, I'm going to set my timer. And to the best of my ability and to the best of your ability, we're going to sit in silence for one minute. Okay? On your mark, get set. Shh. job, everyone. So for how many of you that felt like eternity? No one. Good job. It was actually only 30 seconds. <laughs> what happens, good thing that thing didn't go off all of what happens when you're left alone with your thoughts? Mine's most of the time here, and then it gets here later. Um, our culture is, is so noisy, right? There's so much coming in. And it's not just noisy, but it's also noisy. Like the amount of sensory input we get and the lack of silence that we have is incredible. Um, the research has shown that when you're silent, you actually start to develop brain cells. So if you feel dumb, sit in purposeful silence, see what happens. Could be cool. Uh, The other thing that it does, which is really cool, is it helps you sort out your stressed mind. So Dr. Carolyn Leaf calls it um, mental housekeeping. So sometimes when you just sit, and in my mind, I say sit with purpose. Um, It helps you sort out a lot of what's, running around crazy. Do any of your minds look like mine? Just like running around crazy. 
So sitting in silence is actually beneficial to you. And our culture just can't seem to bear the silence. There's always white noise, always something. When you're at the doctor's office, you've got to pick up your phone. You've got to be scrolling. You can't just sit and stare at the water cooler. Listen, ro- let's go to Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I said that earlier about the renewing of the mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So this is saying, do not conform. That means to identify with or to pattern your life after. So that's talking about, obviously, the way we live, but I'm saying it's also talking about the way we think and the way that our mind is processing, the way that we think about others and our circumstances. And he's saying, be transformed, which is transfigured, which actually changes appearance. How many of you can say, yeah, I can tell when there's not good stuff going on here because it's on your face. You think you can hide it, but you know what you can't hide? Your attitude. It's actually impossible to hide your attitude. That's why we call it attitude. You, like you can't, you can't hide it as much as you want to. The word renew is renovation. God wants to do a renovation of our minds. When we moved into our house two years ago, we did a renovation. The problem is we did not do a complete renovation. We did a partial, felt almost complete renovation. The part that we left was the part you should never leave, the carpet. Because when you want to replace the carpet, you have to disassemble beds and take everything out of the room. So right now, my dear husband is so motivated to change that 20-year-old carpet that he has put all the things from the bedrooms into our living room. We don't have a bonus room. We're not that family. We have a living room. That's it. That's where we live. And now it's full of stuff. So he's going to change the, the carpet, and, it's, and he's also going to paint. Note what I'm saying he, not we. It's not we. It's he. He's going to do all of that because I'm not into any of that. I do not like painting because it can't be done perfectly. <laughs> I hate painting so much. So um, the reason I'm telling you this is, You know, people can come into our house and, like, we're starting a life group next Monday, which is why he wants to do it now, because people are going to be in our house, and the carpet is really crazy. He called it drug house carpet. It was really bad. Um, I could live with it, but he could not live with it anymore. And um, so what I'm saying to you is that God wants to do a full renovation. There may be spots or areas like, I really actually really don't want to clean out my closet to re-carpet it. I really don't want to. I'm so serious right now. There's a lot of stuff in my closet. I don't want to clean it out. I have to be in the right mood, you know, to go through the closet. Not in that mood right now, and it's being forced upon me. (laughs) Um, But there are closets in your mind that you don't think are detrimental. God wants to renovate those. He wants you to, to go into all your house. He wants to renovate every single nook and cranny and crevice of your mind. Don't hold one back saying, oh, this one's actually not that bad. I'll remind you, Romans 8, 6 says, letting the sinful nature control any part of us, including those little closets, leads to death. Okay? Silence. Your mind is your God-given ability to think. How many times do our emotions get in that way? Man, it's like, emotional wall, think. Right? Maybe certain times of the month for... The ladies in the room, men, you be quiet. I'm going to read you this. Something to be aware of. Even though you're presented with evidence that something is true, you won't really believe it unless you feel that it's true. It may be reasonable, logical, scientifically proven, or just plain common sense. But you won't believe it unless your brain's limbic system, which is the seat of your emotions, allows you to feel that it's true. How many times have you experienced that? Your emotions and your feelings are telling you, "Mm -mm, that's not true. But the truth is, 
wearing a mask in your car by yourself? <laughs> Not doing anyone any favors. <laughs> Maybe they do it so we laugh. That's probably not true. I don't think anybody does it for that reason. <laughs> Your feelings are real, but they're not always true. I think that's why the first thing in Philippians he said is, whatever is true. Think about those things. A tool to help you when emotions are taking over. So close your eyes real quick. I'm not going to do anything to you, and it's not going to be a minute. I'm just going to read this to you. I just want you to be able to picture it in your mind. When your emotions are taking over, I want you to picture a scary, ugly, toxic tree with all your negative emotions and attitudes. Imagine ripping the emotions off the tree like a fruit and seeing the well-defined branches with all the information of the situation hanging on the tree in a clear and clinical way, which will help you have insight on what to do next. Now focus on the content and words of this tree, which will help you see the actual problem or issue that was previously blocked by your toxic emotions. When you see it logically, you can partner with Holy Spirit to come up with a plan of action or a solution. Isn't that good? So we can picture it when we're spiraling. You know what? Husbands, just don't ever say, honey, how's that tree looking? Just don't. Because we know about the tree, okay? We can rip off the emotions off the tree if we want to. We don't need you to coach us in that one, okay? So what are some of your toxic thoughts? For me, I have a really loud inner critic. So um, after this message, you don't need to criticize me. I'll do it myself. I'm good. Okay, anytime my husband will bring something to me, usually I've already played that over several thousands of times in my head. If it happens to be a blind spot, which who has those? I, I like, uh, bad things happen in me. Like, it's like, how many conversations have I had with lipstick on my teeth? That's how blind spot revelation feels to me. Um, Some other toxic thoughts are what I'm doing doesn't matter or my life has little to no impact. Maybe if you're a teenager in the room, some of your toxic thoughts are directly towards your family, your parents or your siblings or the house you find yourself in. Maybe it's past failures or past traumas. Um, Maybe you have toxic thoughts about your body or your body image uh, or that person hurt me and doesn't deserve forgiveness. That's a toxic thought. We all don't deserve forgiveness. None of us deserve forgiveness. So who are we to decide who deserves it and who doesn't? No one would care or notice if I wasn't around anymore. Life is not worth living. That's a lie. Um, Another toxic thought, I don't need to get out of bed. Now, if you're lazy, get out of bed. But the one I'm talking about is this sneaky form of depression that says you don't need to get out of bed. And a lot of times this comes with a change in season, a change in life season. Like when my youngest, my twins, went to kindergarten, there there was two or three weeks where I was kind of spiraling. Like, these are the last of my kids. They're in school. Now my life doesn't have meaning anymore. What do I do? All of those things. Or maybe you're a recent empty nester or... Um, retired. Sometimes these new seasons bring on a season of depression, and that's not God's best for you, and it wasn't God's best for me. Um, So just four quick things to jot down is uh, get out of bed, do your devotions, get into the Word because the Word will bring life to you, go on a walk, and learn something new. Because learning something new can help get you out of that oomph. You know what I mean? Okay, and then another one that I think we all deal with in toxicity in our minds is living in a fantasy world. And a lot of times this just looks like, what could life look like if I lived in Texas? (laughs) Aren't all your friends moving to Texas right now? (laughs) Everybody's moving to Texas because the grass is always greener in Texas. And it's very dry there. Um... (laughs) But what could be is not God's best for you because God has you where you are right now. 
with the spouse that you're in bed with, hopefully, right now, in the school you're in right now, or your school you're not in right now, whatever that looks like, God's best for you is not in a fantasy, okay? And I just want to remind you, like, if you see this area as not harming anyone, letting the sinful nature control any part of your mind and thoughts leads to death. And entertaining those thoughts will lead to death. Paul pretty much had this sort of sorted when he was talking about finding contentment later on in Philippians 4. And he said, I found contentment no matter what the circumstance. He was actually in prison when he wrote that. So it's possible to be free when you're not free. Yes? And the toxic thought that I think we're all facing right now is things won't change and I don't have the power to change it, which produces hopelessness and helplessness, which again is not God's best. Right now, many of us feel powerless and we are told we can't possibly think for ourselves and we can't change what's happening. But what you can control and what you do have the power over is your thought life. And that has the power to actually change everything. Because Proverbs 4.23 says, your thoughts run your life. And we have the power to change that, to get control of that. Imagine if the people of God actually chose to access Holy Spirit's power to renovate their thinking. Because Jesus' words are, apart from me, you're screwed. (laughs) Paraphrase. It's It's in there. It's in my version. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So why would we try? We've got to partner with him. He's here to partner with us. So I'm a practical girl. I'm going to give you uh, some, some tools in three practical areas. Some of you, this is going to be too practical. Welcome to church. Okay, the first thing is, in our God scenario, is just say Jesus' name. Sometimes our emotions and our thought life is just spiraling, and it's just like, ah! Just say Jesus' name. Do you want to know why? Because Jesus' name is above every other name. It's above anxiety. That's a name. Depression. Cancer. It's above fear. Jesus' name is above those things. So saying his name is powerful. It's so powerful. Um, Second thing is pray in your spiritual language. Some of you might have differing ideas on this. I'm going to tell you. It's like owning a Cuisinart, and you've been, um, you have all the attachments, and you've been shredding cheese on an old cheese grater. (laughs) And then you get the Cuisinart attachment for shredding cheese. Have you ever experienced the Cuisinart shredding cheese attachment? (laughs) Seriously? Only like three of you? Okay, but for reals. Have you ever, oh my gosh, guys, get it, change your life, nachos every day. Praying in your spiritual language is one of the gifts of the spirit. It's like an attachment on your accusing art that you need. It's powerful. Guys, it's powerful. Um, The other one is play worship music. Uh, If your mind is just going then get on some worship music. Some bands are Maverick City, House Fires, United Pursuit, Bethel. These are some of my favorites. Now we have a radio station, 93.7, that plays worship music all the time. It's awesome. It's so, so good. When you're here in this room and you're in worship and you experience peace, that's because he himself is our peace. So when you get in his presence, that's peace. So get into worship music. Okay, in our relationship with others, woman or man, whichever. Uh, James 5.16 says to confess your sins to each other so that you can be healed. It it does not say confess your sins to a group of people. So life groups are coming up. Don't do that. that. It's awkward. Okay? (laughs) Just pick one person. Just one person. We don't all want to hear it. Um... (laughs) We, we should, should all have, like, one person that we can talk to. It's not going to judge you. It's not going to write you off where you can say, I got this thought spinning, and is it weird? And they can be like, yeah, it's weird. 
Or they can say, no, it's not weird. You should give your kids baths more than once a week. <laughs> so determine your person. Sometimes it's your spouse. Sometimes it's a friend. In seasons of my life, it's been a counselor because none of y'all want to be hearing what's happening in here. It's a paid pr- I pay somebody to listen <laughs> to what's happening. And then have them pray for you. Because James 5.16, they'll pray for you and you'll be healed. That's actually productive in your conversation. Have them pray for you. If they don't offer, just say, pray for me. I need you to pray for me. And then the last one is, what do you do with yourself? Uh, I, I recommend sitting in silence. Start with one minute. Oh, sorry, start with three minutes. If you can't make it three minutes, start with one minute. Um, invite the Holy Spirit to come. Uh, he, he's pretty cool. Start with three minutes, make your goal seven to 15 minutes, and write down the toxic thoughts that pop up. Sometimes it might be like one that you're like, I got to really hone in on this, or it might be five or six, and you say, Lord, which one do we going to tackle first? And you find the lie or the root, and you write the truth. An example would be, I get angry at my girls because they cannot clean their room. They can't. As much as I try to get them to, it's like they can't. And so that's like a a toxic thing. Anger is toxic, right? Um, So I sit there and I kind of like, okay, let's find a little bit more of the root of that. The root of that is I am allowing too much stuff in the room, right? There's too much stuff. They're overwhelmed. They can't put it all away. Um, But don't stop there because the truth is not... I'm a failure as a mother, okay? The truth is not, I should be a minimalist. That's not where the prayer session ends. You've got to go a little further to find the truth. The truth is, I'm a work in progress. The truth is, perfection won't be reached till heaven. I have to tell myself this. Um, and then I just say, Lord, what's my next step? Right? My next step is to do a little purging. But I'm not a failure as a mother. (laughs) You are the worst. (laughs) Now, you can come play the guitar now. So this is not God's best for you. Do we all agree? But this takes work. We can't bippity-boppity-boo it. It takes work. But with the Holy Spirit's help, it can be awesome. That's over there now. (laughs) So I'm going to pray over your minds. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here. Thank you that you're with us. You know, if you're in this room and you came and you feel like your thoughts are so jumbled and your mind is unhealthy, there's hope for you today. If you don't yet know the Lord, there's hope for you today. Today's a really good day to give your life to the Lord. Jesus died so that you could have freedom now and life with him in eternity. And he's calling you today. So Lord, we surrender again our minds, our own thoughts, our own ideas, our own intentions. Would you help us to do the work, to partner with you, to do the work of renovating our minds. Every back hidden closet, all the carpets that need replacing. Holy Spirit, would you come partner with us to do the work, to have true freedom in our thought lives, knowing what we think about actually runs our life. We want to be healthy in our thought life, but we need you. We need your help, Lord. So I pray over every mind in this room, every individual sitting here, for a supernatural work to be done as we surrender. Lord, that we are a work in progress and that you're with us along the way, that you don't expect perfection. In 
Jesus' name. I want to read this scripture. I feel like I just read for the first time this week, which is not possible. Titus 3, 3 through 7. This is the gospel, okay? At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. This might be you today. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of the right things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, having been justified by His great grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Isn't that amazing? Oh, I love it. Here, stand with us. We're going to worship.